welcome everyone to Can Sport Survive the Culture Wars? When we were discussing programming this debate, taking the knee was all the rage. Simone Biles was in the news um, for the, her mental health issues uh, during the Olympics. Um, and those issues have moved on every week. There seems to be a new debate around sports and politics. In, just in the last week, we've had Tammy Abraham coming out as having been vaccinated for COVID, which is quite a peculiar thing, but the whole debate around football is being vaccinated. And then there's obviously people being seen the last few days, Saudis on Tyneside, and that whole discussion of Newcastle United takeover and what that means for politics, what does it mean for sport, people getting on their high horse about it. Um, so is this, you know, sport and politics, and particularly with the Olympics, has always been intertwined. So what is new? Is anything new? Or are the culture wars more generally causing a problem for sport? So these are the sort of issues we'll be raising in the next hour or so. Um, my panel, who give initial short introductions, and I'll introduce them very briefly, and they can say more about you know, their, their sporting interests as we discuss it, and, and then we'll move through to the audience. So first um, uh, to speak is uh, Donald Clark, who is a tech entrepreneur, investor, professor, author, founder of Epic PLC, and CEO of Wildfire, and has a long-term interest in the effect of sport and society, or the relationship of sport and society. Uh, Donald will speak first. Then Oscar, at the, on the right here, who's a political and social commentator, host of a Pint of Interest sports uh, podcast, and has a lot of interest in, in, in many sporting uh, issues. Then Sophie, to my right, who's a business management student, Durham University, writer and commentator, uh, footballer currently for Middlesbrough Women's Football Club. Um, and so Sophie uh, will give her perspective. And then uh, finally, to my left, Dula Palaraja, who's a football writer, long-term spike contributor, co-founder of Libero, and network season ticket holder um, at Crystal Palace. And I'll try and restrain the Crystal Palace-Brighton conflict just to my left as we go through the debate. So without any further ado, Donald, do you want to give us your opening remarks and then we'll sure get thing. going? Yeah, so good afternoon, sports fans. Uh, I'm, uh, you can tell I'm from Scotland, so I lived the first half of my life in Scotland in uh, the sort of sectarian world uh, was a, as a boy, a supporter of Glasgow Rangers and witnessed some quite horrific things uh, in football in those days. Second half of my life in Brighton, so the contrast was quite stark, <laughs> let's say. Uh, and all my, interestingly, given my background, the thing that really sparked off my interest in sport was when I was 14 years old, because I was involved in, so the younger people won't know about this probably, the Ibrox disaster, which was 50 years ago, and I was on that staircase, and 66 people died. And so, uh, really from that day on, I've taken a more, you know, I, uh, you know, a, you know, a bird's eye view of sport very often, as opposed to my love of, of sport full stop. Secondly, you know, I've been involved as a business person in sponsoring youth football teams. I'm a big believer in grassroots sports as a social, uh, an agent of social change. Uh, my son is uh, uh, in the international in the England team. It's quite odd if you're Scottish coming to the Southern England team. Uh, uh, in Taekwondo, he'll be fighting in the European <coughs> Championships next month. And so I have a deep interest in sport and have all my life. But what I just want to really address today is something, a, a single proposition really, which is despite some of my experience in sport, I really do believe that sport is the solution to the cultural world. I think it's a, you know, a marvelous thing, full stop. But first of all, let's dwell on what sport is, because there are two roots in our society in the West here. There's the Olympic tradition. Anybody know how long the Olympics lasted for, from the first Olympics to the last? Any guesses? No? None at all. Okay, 1,160 years from 776 BC to 395 AD, over 1,000 years. Now, if the premiership had been going that long, the first premiership match would have been in the reign of King Alfred <laughs> to today. That's how long it was, every four years. And there's something quite interesting about the Olympics, which is that notion that you stop every four years, everybody puts their arms down, there's a truce, and then meritocracy kicks in. 
it was a wonderful thing. People came from all over the Greek world, from Sicily, North Africa, and so on. But that isn't really the source of sport as we know it today, because the source of sport today, and I tip my hat to all the English people in the room here, because you guys really invented modern sport in the, in the mid-19th century, really between 1850 and 1870. So when the Industrial Revolution takes place, mar you know, a huge industrialization, and everybody had one or two days off, you had the introduction of football, rugby, cricket, and a whole number of sports, but in that 20-year period, really. And if you really want to read about detail, I really recommend this book, The English and Their History. Remember, I'm Scottish, I'm recommending this. But it is an excellent book if you want to know about that, because he has a chapter on the origin of sport. And it was linked to another great institution in England, the pub. There was a massive <coughs> number of pub teams throughout the late 19th century, and there still is today. If you're involved in football, you'll probably know this. So the first big cultural you know, war, in a sense, however, in sport was very early on, and that was class. So you had in rugby, for example, because the working class rugby team started thrashing the posh boys, they actually threw them out. And hence, in the north, you now have a rugby league. They were actually expelled. Uh, and we still have the class issue in rugby union. You know that whole rugger is great, nobody, you know, that, that whole moralization of sport and that rugby football comparison it, is, is still with us today, certainly. And I think there was an interesting skirmish recently, which was the European Super League, where the 1% marches in and said, yeah, we're going you know, to make more money, more profits. And it only took two days for ordinary people to say, yeah, that will be all right. <laughs> a few fans come out, and of course, they saw the writing on the wall and cancelled it immediately. So we had a, a sort of class backlash there. Power, fans have a huge amount of power here. It, I'll, another aspect of the cultural world that did interest me because it was so minor, but interesting nevertheless, was homophobia in football, which is not a big issue, to be honest. But in Brighton, <coughs> it was. So with the, when Brighton went into the Premiership, a really bizarre thing happened. Some of the opposing uh, fans would start invented homophobic chants. And so the very famous one that sort of caught fire a little bit was, uh, you're going down on each other, down on each other. <laughs> you, get, you get the idea to Guadalajara. The Brighton... I mean, I have to say, I quite admire, whoever, whoever actually wrote those lyrics and got all those people to sing, I quite admire their, their chutzpah, as it were. Interestingly, the Brighton fans then responded uh, with their own chant, which was, you're too ugly to be gay, you're too <laughs> ugly to be gay. And so it was like a 1-1 one -one draw. And to be honest, that lasted for about a season. And then it all died away, because it was just a bit dull. So it was, and don't underestimate that humor, the way in which football deals with those issues is quite often. You know, people go to football on a Saturday because they want to have a chat and a laugh with their mates. They don't really want to go to, to have a moral lecture. That's the truth of the matter. So everybody called a truce on that one. So that was the homophobia thing. I think there are other skirmishes. To be honest, you know that I'm a celebrity, let me fix your cultural problems, you know, <laughs> from, the, from Rashford. Remember, for, for everyone, uh, for every, you know, uh, Gary Lineker and Rashford and so on, you've also got Paolo Di Canio giving Nazi salutes. So we we'll always have celebrities telling us what to do and trying to impose their political views. I believe that's actually relatively small beer, to be honest, in football. Most people ignore it. A big one, however, in my life was sectarianism. And let me tell you what it was like to be in a crowd of 30 and 40,000 people, and that was just half of them, my side, Glasgow Rangers, who had hideous racism, hideous sectarianism. You know, there were, you know I, I, can almost, I, I can't really tell you what they were saying. It's so embarrassing for people of color in the, in the audience here. But, uh, you know, and that's still around today in Scotland. So that's a political element that hasn't been sorted. However, football is a bit of a healer there now, because if you go to Scotland now, my father has been down. Uh, recently, and uh, he's 86, and he said that no longer happens in Scotland now. So I think it's dampening down, and football's been an enabler of that. However, let me end on one thing. The trans issue, however, <coughs> is different because it threatens the very nature of sport itself. Now, this guy down here uh, fights at, Europe, at the world level, you know, he's in the England team on a contact sport in Taekwondo, and he will tell you that it's downright dangerous, and in USC and, uh, and martial arts, people are going to get killed. People will die if this continues. Because the biological inheritance through puberty gives men an enormous advantage in terms of muscle mass, less fat, even the size of the pelvis. There are 101 dimensions here. If you want a really good chapter on this, then Helen Joyce has an excellent chapter in this book on trans here, where she lays that stuff down. Let's not go into, here, into that here. However, I think sport 
Remember I said at the beginning of my proposition that sport is a healer here and it solves cultural problems? I think that's what's happening. There is a huge backlash against this, massive backlash. So the IOC tried to solve the problem by having testosterone tests. Actually, it wasn't enough because the inheritance from puberty still gives massive advantage. But recently, the National Sports Organization in the UK has said, no, 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 in contact sports, this will not carry. So I think over the next two years, you will see a, you know, a, a, a sort of reining back of those rules because sport fights back. It's just madness. It is clearly mad to have people uh, fighting, or especially contact sports and in rugby and those sort of sports, uh, where people are endangering others and actually, more importantly, just undermining the whole concept of fairness. It makes no sense whatsoever. So I'll end there, just say, you know, sport's great because it solves these problems, I think. And long may that continue. Thanks very much, Tom. <laughs> Um, right, I'm going to start by introducing myself. So obviously I'm uh, Oscar, and I'll explain my relationship with sport. Uh, I've played sport probably since I was about four years old. Um, when I was a kid, I'm half Spanish. I used to play with my cousins, who are about ten years older than me. Um, so I did all that. I now coach football. I coach two youth football teams. Uh, and on top of that, I'm a, uh, quite a depressed Arsenal fan at the moment. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, so that's my relationship with sport. Um, so I'd say, I'd say that there's no doubt that sport has been engulfed uh, with the culture war. Um, you can see this because in society, all the topics that we're talking about has been transferred over to sport. So we've seen recently with the vaccine passport, or with the vaccine, you know, players should take the vaccine. We've seen it with BLM, taking a knee, mental health, cancel culture. All these buzzwords that we get in a society we're also, is also transferred into the sporting world. And I don't think that's a particularly healthy thing. Um, but do I think sport can survive the culture war? Yes. Uh, and I'll give this, a, uh, this brief summary as to why I think it can. I think if you compare sport to every other single entertainment um, sector or institution, the difference sports has is that it is in a sporting arena with live fans, which, are, which is completely unpredictable. You don't know what those fans are going to say, do, how they're going to act, how they're going to react to you. Whereas if you look at Hollywood, if you go to Hollywood, for example, they're mingling with people like themselves, who think like themselves, and there's no direct relationship with the fans, there's no direct accountability. Whereas in sport, for example, if you take football, for example, uh, take the, 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 the taking the knee, right? And I know it's a controversial subject, but when they did it, a lot of fans booed, a lot of fans cheered, right? So, it, so, it, so it, that basically explains to you that actually there is accountability there, and fans won't take too much politics into sport. There will be a line which, uh, which won't be crossed. Also, when we talk about sport, we also have to take into account that it's not just elite sport, right? There's a lot of other sports, right? So, you know, grassroots sport, which I'm involved in, um, you know, kids' sport, um, uh, and so on and so forth, you know, small athletics uh, clubs. And those really haven't been politicised. Those are safe at the moment. So those are, have been untouched. Um, but I will say this. I'm going to mention three uh, quick points about um, where I think sport needs to be careful. Uh, and if it goes down this path, then we are in, in, in for... Uh, for, well, not a treat, but a uh, disaster. Um, the first one, I'd say, is the problem with the culture. The problem with the culture is incredibly divisive, and it doesn't have any nuance, right? So um, take this, for example. Uh, with, fo with football, with culture, you're either woke, right, or you're anti-woke. So, so the topics that I mentioned at the top, so can cancel culture, mental health, Black Lives Matter, the vaccine, right? So... <laughs> Yeah, they come in packages, so you're for all of them or you're against all of them. You can't say, actually, I think that we need uh, to invest more in mental health for these young athletes because, you know, the, the, it's a changing world and they've got Twitter and they've got other pressures. You know, there, there was a 19-year-old girl, uh, Emma Raducanu, who, who had literally the weight of a nation on her. That's incredible pressure. So there needs to be more in mental health. But also, by the same token, you can say, well, actually, I disagree with forcing players to take the vaccine. That's a legitimate position. So there's no nuance. It's all sort of black and white. And that obviously can be seen most from, uh, from my perspective with the taking of the knee, right? My problem with the knee taking isn't necessarily the gesture um, itself in terms of what it represents, right? The problem with the knee is that it's there to be an anti-racist gesture, right? The bottom line is some people don't think it's an anti-racist gesture. Whether you agree with it or not, they see it as, as, uh, as a far left, Marxist trot, whatever you want to call it, organization, right? And they would see it, see it sort of mixed in there. 
Other people see it as anti-racism. So what you end up happening is you've got one group of people shouting, you're a bigot, you're a racist, you're a you know, fascist. Another group of people shouting, you're a Marxist, you're a trot, you're a, fat, you're a you know, socialist. But actually, none of those things are probably true. There is an in-between here, right? So the problem with it is that they probably both have a point, right? So in my opinion, you can't, you can't completely disassociate the knee-taking with, um, with the BLM, the organisation. They're, they're, they're relatively linked. For the same token, you know, Harry Kane's not a Marxist because he's taking the knee. And if you think that, then you know, can't really help you. But um, so, the, so the point is, it's so divisive. So I say, why don't you find another gesture Right, which can actually unify people from different points of view, different political backgrounds, right, to actually combat racism. Because if racism is the thing you're trying to combat, then the, the best way to, to have a social movement is to have as many people follow you as possible. And you're not going to do that through divisive uh, things, which, which, which just divide people constantly uh, along these lines. And lastly, uh, I'll say, uh, before I hand over, I'll say that one of the issues I, I spotted during the Euros was the fact that with this culture war, it's not just politics is going into sport, but sport is going into politics, right? So with the Euros, for example, what we found was, what I found, like you may agree with me or disagree with me, but I found that the two major parties were trying to own the England football team, right, constantly. So you had Boris Johnson, who doesn't like football, probably never been to a football game in his life, say, this is our England, I'm patriotic, I'm going to have a, you know, St George's flag this big, and, you know, it's all about patriotism. By the same token, you had Keir Starmer go, this represents our values, this is you know, multi-ethnic, this is progressive patriotism. So now what you've got a situation is, not only is, is, is football quite divisive in terms of the, 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 um, the culture wars, it's actually sport is also affecting politics. Politicians are trying to manipulate people into sport. Right? Never once during the Euro did I go in, in a pub and speak to someone and someone care what Boris Johnson or Keir Starmer thought about football. But they're trying to use it. And so... Those are the three things I think uh, uh, that we have a danger, uh, that are very dangerous um, uh, for us in, in, in sport that we have to combat. Um, so um, the divisiveness and, and, uh, and the, the sport going into politics. And I'll end it there. Thanks very much, Oscar. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I'll quickly introduce myself. Hi, guys. I'm Sophie, and I do currently play for Middlesbrough Women, so we play in the third tier of women's football here in the UK. Uh, as Oscar said, there is no doubt that sport has been embroiled in the culture war. However, whether it will survive is a difficult one. Male sports will be fine. They have millions of fans, and despite the social media circuses of people being sick of players' constant woke virtue signalling, it will survive. Women's sports, however, not so much. The militant trans activists have hijacked our sports and female athletes have been silenced out of fear. Not me, I won't, I refuse to. Here's the thing, men are faster than us, they are bigger than us, they are stronger than us, and most of the time, they're better than us. That doesn't take anything away from female athletes or our achievements. They didn't separate male and female sports for a laugh. They didn't separate male and female sports because we're called men, they're called men, and we happen to be called women. They did it so that we could stand the chance. Because the reality is, if we didn't have female sports, we wouldn't be able to access the opportunities, no matter how hard we worked, if we were competing against men. That's just the way it is. So how on earth can you tell me that a person who has gone through puberty as a male should be competing in women's sports? I don't care what you want to call yourself. I really don't care at all. But you cannot undo the biological advantage that you were born with. And now we can see in women's sports that we have women being beaten up by men, having their skulls fractured in female fighting, women losing out places on Olympic teams that they've worked their entire lives for, <coughs> Or Laurel Hubbard winning Sportswoman of the Year when she failed to even register a lift, despite Lisa Carrington becoming New Zealand's most decorated Olympian. Once again, women are left in the dust to people who were born men. We can never come first. The reality is, women's sport took thousands and hundreds of years to become what it is today. And that will be undone in a fraction of that time under so-called progressiveness. How is that progressive? 
What is progressive about seeing a woman being beaten? What is progressive about women's hard work being undone in five minutes to men? How can you tell me that that misogyny is progressive? Anybody? It's not. It's very simply not. But they've somehow managed to convince the world that it is. And the reality is, as female footballers, the generation before us have worked tirelessly to get this game to where it is today. The people that I proudly share the pitch with, the game that they grew up with, is completely different to the one that I've grown up with. And hopefully today's game is completely different to the ones that the next generation will. And we'll make sure of that. But they have worked boldly to break down the barriers so that we can have the opportunities that we have today. So it is in my generation and this generation of football's best interest to make those guys proud and to make sure that this game doesn't fall apart to the woke and progressives. We cannot let wokeness win. The sport that I played today was banned for 50 years just because I was a woman. And now it's probably going to be gone for good if we don't start speaking up and talking about our sport. So women's athletes, you can be scared all of you like, but it's now time to put ourselves in the shoes and the bold shoes that those in the generations before us did in breaking down the barriers, in breaking down this new one. We have always, as women, been on the back foot in sport, but now we're on the back foot again, just to, and we are victims of a different cause, and that's the culture war. And that's all I'll leave it for you today, is that male sports will be fine, but female sports is a completely different story. And we need to change that story, because if we don't, we'll give up everything everybody fought for in the past. Thank you. Thanks so much. Sir. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dilly Paliraja. I, I write about football. I play it. I uh, watch it. I'll let others judge whether I'm any good at playing or writing. Um, so can sports survive the culture wars? Um, the short answer is yes, but that's probably a bit too short for Jeff's liking. So my three-minute answer um, is as follows. So I think, first of all, we need to kind of figure out what the question means. I think there are, you know, what, what does the destruction of sport in the cultural conflict look like? Um, so I think there are two ways we can understand this. Firstly, um, there is sport itself. And the essence of sport, I think, is it's a competitive activity. The point of sport is to win. Um, Citius, altius, fortius is the Olympic motto, which means faster, higher, stronger. Um, you know, it, it's about excelling, it's about being the best, it's about um, beating the opposition. However, I think we can see that there's evidence that the goal of winning is, is starting to be corroded a bit. So um, the IOC added an, a new word to the Olympic motto recently, which is together, which is a hurrah word, which is kind of vacuous, sounds good, means absolutely nothing. Uh, I think it's got something to do with the unifying uh, power of sport and so on, but actually it's vacuous. And I fully expect that by the Paris Games, we'll see yet more vacuous virtue signaling words added to the Olympic motto. I think my money's on wellness. Um, and I think we, in, in the last year, we've seen the kind of inexorable rise of mental well-being as a sporting virtue. So Simone Biles, Naomi Osaka, Ben Stokes, the cricketer, they've all been praised for taking time out of their respective sports to look after their mental health. Um, now, I think it's fine if, you, if you're not feeling up to it to, to withdraw from sport. Well, what, I think the response to it is more, more interesting. It's, it's, these people are, are kind of lauded as, as kind of sporting heroes in a way. Um, and if wellness and mental wellness matters as much as winning, then I think that the essence of competitive sport is, is degraded. Um, and another example would, I, I think, where sport, the essence of sport is at risk, and we've heard this very art articulately explained, is you know, uh, trans women, i.e. men, in dresses, competing in women's sport. Um, and Laurel Hubbard is you know, the first trans athlete to compete in the Olympic Games. Why is this a problem? I think it's a problem, very simply, as my fellow uh, contributors have said, is because it undermines the integrity of sport. It, it, 
it undermines the concept of a fair contest of a level playing field. Um, so, so that that in that respect, I think that sport could actually be harmed if this phenomenon were allowed to go unchecked. And I think it can it can be checked. Um, I think the, the, the second kind of way in which we can understand um, the corrosive impact of the culture wars on sport is as a sporting spectacle. Um, so taking the knee is probably the kind of new kid on the block in terms of the culture wars, but there's been a culture war in English football for <coughs> over 20 years, and I've been writing about it for Spite for probably as long. Um, so, you know, we've, we've seen an, a consistent attempt by the football authorities to clamp down on offensive chanting. You know, you can't say that. Um, and it started with racist chanting, it extended to homophobic chanting. Spurs fans were threatened with arrest for, for singing songs where they referred to themselves as the Yid Army. Um, and I think, you know, the football authorities would like football to be a family game for, for, for the kind of new middle class fans that have been attracted to football since the 90s. Um, but I think that, you know, the joy of going to football is is basically to trade abuse. I mean, you know, as a Palace fan, there hasn't been a lot of good football to watch over the years, but trading abuse has been glorious. <laughs> right? It's panto for adults, but, you know. And if you take it literally and take it seriously, you're missing the point. Right? It, it, it is what football is all about, having a few drinks, going to the game with your mates, um, hurling dogs at you to the opposition. If you can't do that, then you damage the sporting spectacle, uh, in my opinion. So, to conclude, um, sport has certainly been caught in the crossfire of the culture wars, um, and, it, and it, could, it could die, it could be damaged, but I think it's not inevitable that sport will be damaged or sport will die, and I think there's a very good reason for that, and it's because of us. It's because the sporting public won't let that happen. Um, sports fans value winning and sporting excellence, um, you know, you, there's no amount of wokeness will stop people believing that the point of sport is to win. Um, we've had, to, as I said, we've had like probably about 25, 30 years of <coughs> attempts to sanitise football fans to stop them, you know, bit chanting offensive things, running on the pitch, drinking alcohol in the view of the pitch, all that sort of stuff. It really hasn't penetrated football culture as much as it should have for 25 years of, of kind of culture war. Um, and why? Because football fans, predominantly who are work, still working class, don't like being told what to do. You know, they will boo taking the knee. They all continue to boo national anthems. And I actually don't think taking the knee would have um, become institutionalised if it hadn't happened during lockdown because there weren't football fans there to boo it. I think the, if, if during lockdown people had started taking the knee, I think it would have stopped very quickly. Um, so I'll give you an example of why I think, um, you know, what's joyous about football and why I don't think it will be completely consumed by the culture war. Um, I, I went to um, see West Ham um, against Palace recently and I was sat near the West Ham fans and the whole game, there were sections of fans on both sides who spent the whole game just trading abuse hurling insults at each other, showing each other V signs, the finger, wanker signs, throat slitting signs, offering each other out for a fight. Um, there was a viral video which showed <coughs> West Ham fans, um, I shouldn't laugh, uh, chanting, she's got chlamydia at a, palace, a female palace fan, which you might find offensive. Um, but it just shows that, you know, the, the, the kind of woke culture ha really hasn't penetrated working class football fans, and I think that's a good thing. Um, and you know what? All, all of the trading of abuse, and particularly when, you know, when the goals went in, it was 2-2, each time a goal went in, the, some fans were celebrating um, you know, with the players, others just turned to the opposition and started giving it all that. And, and it was just, it was glorious fun. <clears throat> and it was in stark contrast to a year of watching um, sterile football on television during lockdown with, with no fans in the stadium, no beer in hand, on your television, 
it, you know, it's re it was really a, a, a painful experience. I, I really didn't enjoy it at all. And, you know, and I think that's, that's, the, uh, that's the joy of football. And I think that that's why, you know, the, the trading of abuse, the banter, fans will continue to do that. And I think it's very difficult to stop it. So I'll just finish up. I think sport could be damaged, but I'm confident it won't. I'm, and I'm confident it won't because I trust in the common sense of the sporting public to see through the bullshit and refuse to allow wokeness to destroy the competitive essence of football and the carnivalesque spectacle of being a football fan. Thank okay, thank you. So, uh, without any further ado, are there any people, uh, some, some hands up there? But yeah, have you just... Uh, thanks very much to the panel, very interesting uh, introductions. I have a question for Sophie, really, which is, um, I'm a part-time cricket administrator. Uh, I don't know if you know the case of Maxine Blithin, who, uh, obviously a trans woman, um, was it trans man? She's a bloke <laughs> who plays cricket in the women's team, but she, she plays up to county level. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen anything of her. She's uh, quite famous in the cricketing circles. She's very good. Um, she obviously wins a lot of trophies, and um, yeah, she's a major player in, in cricket. Um, but when you when you look at her and when you see her, you know everything about her you see as a woman. Yeah, I know she's not, but everything you see her about a woman. But what is the choice for her if she can't play cricket? to the level and who she wants to play with, yeah? What is the choice for her? Because I think, unless we have an answer to that question, then what do we do? I mean, I, I completely accept, you know, all your concerns about, you know, female sport and fairness and all the rest of it, but what about her? And what about those people like her who want to play in the sport of their chosen gender but are not allowed to do so? And her only choice to me sounds like she's got to play cricket against blokes. She might not feel that comfortable about that. So what is, you know, what is the answer to her? That's all. Okay, hang on, we'll take a few and then we'll come back. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, I was going to say, I, I agree that football, uh, football is a great uh, healer and kind of solves cultural problems. I thought Joe Rogan and Michael Bisping were particularly good on the trans MMA issue. Um, I think football crowds aren't interested in lectures and the middle class sneering at them because they're mainly a working class space. So they don't like being told they should uh, support taking the knee and that they're all kind of, um, you know, crude and right wing and they ought to just get, be, get, get with the programme. They don't like the knee at West Ham. I wasn't the same game as you, by the way, the Palace game. And I also thought it was glorious. And, um, you know, some, some fans boo, boo the knee at West Ham, others don't. But what's happening now is the time that it's being taken is less and less. It seems to be about three seconds, and then the booing starts, and then it stops. And I've got a feeling that might, that might, it might die out entirely uh, because of that. And uh, I was just thinking, um, um, sorry, I think one of the, pl the players have got on board with this, a lot of them. And I, think, I don't think Gareth Southgate's role has been particularly good in, in promoting it, actually just saying, oh, it's all about anti-racism. Because I think what they should probably admit is that racism isn't what it was in football, and it's a minor issue now. And it doesn't cost the players anything to go, to, put a knee, to go on the knee, but it would cost them if they all wore a T-shirt that said, we're donating 10% of our wages to local schools to help out the poor kids get involved in sport. So that's the kind of gesture I'd quite like to see. But I don't see any of them volunteering for it. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask the panellists what they think of the media hypocrisy where one week the media were supporting, and rightly so, of the, all the online abuse that the players were enduring. Um, and then the following week when some players refused to take the vaccine, um, wanted to know what the panellists think about that and if, if they believe that it's, it's a type of hypocrisy as well. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Johnny. I, I'm a, a, a confession time now. I, I'm a travelling England fan. I've been for 15 years, been up to Scotland a few times. 
drunk in the Loudon Club, uh, which you'll know as a Ranger fan. Um, it's a great place to go before a game. Um, but I think that what well, my concern is uh, is that my life is being put at risk by some of the stories that I put about about the uh, about England fans. England fans aren't <coughs> hooligans. Mostly we're just drunken. Um, and we sing a lot. And the other fans are pissed off because we've got more songs. But, um, and we might make a lot more noise. So, but so, but I'll, I'll give you two instances. I was in Marseille for, in 2016 for the England game and massively over-policed because it was the England fans. The Russians, the Russian hooligans who came over, all with the black things, all, you know, roided up to whatever, uh, were roaming the streets trying to find England fans to beat up. And, and the, the court, because of this, the following day, because I stuck around, because I'd driven all the way down there, so I stuck around for the Denmark game, the police had left the streets, the Russians had left town. You know, some guy was in hospital, I think he was in 18 months in a coma, being stamped, his head stamped on. And, the, you know, the standard, you know, the linickers and all that, same, same story, England fans rioting. We weren't rioting, we were drinking, and we were drinking with the other fans as well. So I, I think this, you know, this myth that's put about, about is it's not just bad, it is actually dangerous, and it's dangerous to me. You fast forward to, 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 the, to the end of the last Euros um, at Wembley, where we had all the problems. Again, the stories were put out about, you know, the, the crowd, the, the fans were plotting, and there were thugs and knuckle dusters, you know, and knuckle draggers, and they were getting okay, absolute bollocks. What happened was that um, it was UEFA who was responsible for the, for the uh, management of the, of the ground, they weren't prepared to put enough money into marshal it properly. They foisted a ticketing system on us, which broke down. And it broke down at the semi-finals, because I was there as well. It didn't work then. There was no COVID testing, because they had an inadequate COVID testing facilities. And because the, the, because the ticketing uh, things weren't working, and they hadn't got enough staff on the gates, I was on the second tier, we couldn't get in, even though we had legitimate tickets. And the crowd was building up behind us, and I'm like, this is, this is Hillsborough waiting to happen. You know, we were one, <coughs> one event away from this really serious incident happening. So what was, and they, say, they opened the doors, just as they built in other games when the ticketing system was broken. They opened the side doors on the, on the thing to try and let fans in and try to verify the tickets. And of course, at that point, everybody piled through. Uh, the crowd, it, it was really dangerous. The sours of the second tier, I don't know if you've been to Wembley, but it, it's steeply raked because you're supposed to be, you know, you're supposed to be seated only. And at the front, you've got a rail about that big. You know, and, and there were thousands of, of extra people. That you, it was standing room only. And it would have only taken a little, a little something, and you'd have had people going over the, side, the front of that and into, the, and into the, you know, the people 30 foot below. And my seat was right at the front as well, so I, I could have been one of them. And obviously, after the game, was the, ticket, was the ticketing fiasco mentioned? No. Was the fact that the policing was woefully inadequate mentioned? No. Was the fact there was no COVID testing going on? No. Nothing was mentioned except that what you saw was a few people fighting, you know, on the ground floor with people getting in through the disabled thing. So a complete whitewash is, 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 it was taking place. And like I say, next time around, we'll have a Hillsborough. And just, in the, just as the first time around with Hillsborough, the, the, the police will, will, will there'll be, a, there'll be a, a concerted effort to sweep under the carpet the, the failings of, of of the authorities. I'll be quite interested to see what the report is when it actually gets delivered. I very much doubt whether it will actually mention some of the, you know, what, what, what actually happened. My experiences of what happened that day and how close we were to, to serious injuries. Thanks, Johnny. Okay, I'll bring the panel in briefly and then we'll go straight back at them. Uh, well, thank you for your question. I really appreciate that. I will answer your question in a second, but I'm actually going to quickly talk about why your question is important. And I'm going to be a bit ruthless here because, let's be honest, honesty is more important than someone's feelings. And the entire... We get this question all the time, and it's actually one of the reasons why women will never speak out about this, because we're always so concerned about somebody else's feelings. But what about the feelings of women's athletes? Why do we only focus on the feelings of the trans athletes? And this is my question, because trans athletes are such a small minority in comparison to all of the women that we're screwing over. So why on earth are we so obsessed with what, how the minority feel instead of the majority? Why are we so fixated on putting the minority first? Where's the common sense in that? Where is the common sense in that? There's none. But to answer your question, I quite frankly don't care where they go. 
The reality is, if they're in their own competition, they have their own competition. If they're in with the men, they have the men. The thing is, they should not be in our sports. And people can call me a transphobe all you like, but I don't care, because the reality is, we've got somebody who is transgender in our league, but they are female to male. And I don't care if they present as a male, because then they have no more advantage than I do. They went through puberty as a woman. They came through the football system as a woman. So they haven't got a greater advantage. Whether they've sh got short hair and call themselves him, that's irrelevant to me. I don't care. Live your life and be who you want to be. But if you've got a biological advantage, you don't belong in my sports. And where you go, I don't care where you go. So if we have a competition with trans people, that's great, because there are more trans people coming in now. And I think that's something that should be... There. Spoke, speaking up about, but if we can't, we shouldn't just accept that they should come into our sports and that we should take the brunt of it because we also have feelings as well as them, and we're the major majority and they're the minority. And of course, we have to protect the minority, but it doesn't mean screwing over all of the majority and the fact that we should stay silent. So that is why your question is important, and that is outside. But I do thank you so much for your question, and I hope that clears things up from my perspective. Of course, everyone else has a different perspective. <laughs> Yeah, I want to pick up on, um, oh, there was two important points there. Uh, someone uh, spoke a little bit about uh, the kneeling and, and, and booing. The hypocrisy comes from, uh, I think, comes from um, the players which, so we've been told for a long time that this is an individual choice and that taking the knee is, is the players decide to do it on an individual basis. Some players do, some players don't. That's what everyone's saying. So why is it there are the, so many players Right, normally uh, foreign players that have come into the Premier League that are taking the knee for their club, then they go play for their country, and they're not taking the knee. I don't understand this logic at all. It makes absolutely zero sense to me. And I think it, is, uh, it, it just shows the hypocrisy of the, of the whole thing. It really is to show a lot of it for, the, for these players. It's, I don't want to be the odd one out. I want to I be like all of my teammates. And if all of my team teammates take the knee, I'll take the knee. And if they don't, and I won't, right? So, really, so, it's, so it's nothing to do with anti-racism. The, the, the campaigns that, were, that I think were, were extraordinary for, for, for anti-racism were the Kick It Out campaign and the Say No to Racism campaign. Right? I've, I've been going to football for about, te for about 10 years, right? It was all over the place. It was on T-shirts, right? UEFA, there was adverts, Say No to Racism. It was extraordinary. It was brilliant. It did a fantastic job in combating racism. All of a sudden, with all of that progress that we made, We've suddenly gone back to divisive times where actually we, we're, we're pinning people against each other, right? And I, just, I, I think, I, I think it's, it's completely wrong, and that needs to change, which is why I think that the, the taking the knee has to change. I think another important point that was raised by a few people, uh, panellists as well, about whether the culture war can um, affect sport is, is the fans and just how important the fans are. Uh, we saw it with the Super League. Now, the Super League, it was, you know, it was uh, I think it got mentioned on the panel as well, the Super League, it was you know, a lot of, uh, massive clubs in, 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 uh, in England, one of them including Arsenal, incidentally, my team, which should be nowhere near that Super League. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, and Tottenham, by the way, uh, which is even more ridiculous. But, um, but yeah, it was, just, it, was a, it was a bunch of clubs that are very, very rich, very wealthy, got together and just wanted to stop the competition. And you saw the, the, the power that fans have. They took to the streets pretty much every single club and just stopped it in their tracks. I mean, it was never going to happen after that. Um, so that is the power of fans. Uh, and, 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 and I think that as well, it got mentioned about, about uh, humour in football. I think that's vitally important. And that's something which I think um, is in danger. Right, with the culture war, it is the humour. Right, I remember I, I went to Arsenal City, the um, the, the five 0 thrashing, and uh, and all all the Arsenal fans were cheering City's fifth goal. I mean, it's just the humour of English football isn't really comparable to any other sport in any other country, I don't think. So I think that's something that we need to keep. And he's, and uh, uh, my fellow panelists as well on on the abuse, um, the give and take abuse between fans. Like it is funny. Like that, that's the point of it. It's it's not personal. It's back and forth, and it's funny. You know, um, you go and you, you, one minute you're trading insults with each other. You know, West Ham that, West Ham this, Arsenal this. And the next minute you're in the pub talking about the game. And then what are you going to have for tea? Like, it's just the nature of, of, of England football fans. Uh, and I think that's something that's so precious, uh, and that can't be forgotten, the, the power that fans have. And um, I don't know, maybe we need to look at, look at something like the German model, with, especially after the Super League, with 50% plus one ownership of clubs for fans. 
uh, I think that might be something uh, to, to, to look at. That might even, even help the culture war. Great. Uh, Tom? Yeah, the cricket question is quite interesting, I think. Where do the people go? And there, the IOC has messed this up, really, by having this strict testosterone test and so on, which is failing and people are reversing out of it. But some other sporting bodies have suggested that there should be a separate category for trans people. This is an interesting proposition. The trouble is you could barely raise probably a cricket team on that basis. So I think that says something in itself, that last sentence, which is the tail is wagging the dog somewhat here. Some tiny, tiny minority of people. And perhaps we should be, I, I take your point there, a bit sort of, you know, loose about this, you know, not having <coughs> absolute rules and everything here, especially at the, you know, the, the lower levels where it doesn't matter so much. I think I'm absolutely on board with you at the, at the higher levels when it becomes blatantly unfair, especially in certain sports, especially in contact sports. But I think that's an interesting proposition. The se separate category has already been suggested by sporting bodies in the UK. On the, on the media issue, there's a very interesting remark quoting Dave Chappelle yesterday, which is, I'm not so worried about the media here because they come and go and it blows hot and cold. And, you know, Twitter, this is it, uh, David, David Chappelle, you know, Twitter is not a real place. <laughs> you know, don't worry about this. You know, we're dealing about real people, real sports, real spectators. I'm less bothered about that. Although in the vaccination issue, I mean, the, the interesting issue was the Argentina, Argentina Brazil match that got cancelled because the players lied and they did lie. And so I don't have much trouble with that, you know, if you're going to have a principal stick to it. But I don't think you should be actually ruining a sporting event where 50,000 people turn up because you lied. You know, I think that, that was a stretch beyond there. And for the other two <coughs> questions, I just wholly agreed with everything you said, so no response to those, you know. Um, yeah, I just want to sort of um, unpick a little bit um, about what I don't like about taking the knee. I, I think when Colin Kaepernick kind of patented the concept, um, took the knee um, in American football, it was a protest um, against racism in, in the States. And it was, he was taking the knee um, instead of uh, standing to the national anthem. You know, you may agree or disagree with, with the protest, but it was a protest and his career was pretty much kind of jeopardized as a consequence. Um, so, you know, it's no longer, taking the knee in English football is no longer, an, isn't an act of rebellion. It's, it's much more like standing for the national anthem. It's the kind of modern version of standing for the national anthem. It's a, it's a requirement. It's a devotional ritual now. And that's what I object to, um, which is that, you know, you're, you, you know, it's like swearing allegiance to the crown or whatever. You know, you're, 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 you're demonstrating your allegiance to the new kind of, you know, the new religion of wokeness. Um, and, you know, the thing, the thing about racism in English football is, I mean, I don't agree that Kick It Out and those campaigns eradicated it. What eradicated racism in English football was, were black players becoming heroes to white fans. And that happened long before Kick It Out, you know. I mean, I've been going to football for a, lo a, lo a long time. And I have, there isn't racist chanting. If you want, if you want racist chanting um, at football, go abroad. You'll find it abroad. But you won't find it in English football, not mass chanting. You might find the odd racist. But by and large, it doesn't happen. It's not tolerated. Um, and it, it's a kind of fictitious problem, right? And the only place you can find it is, in, is on Twitter and in social media. You know? And it's 15-year-olds so, or some social inadequates who live with their mum still, who are posting abuse, you know, on anonymous Twitter accounts. I mean, that's to me, that's not a social problem. It's in the very margins of society that you'll find racist abuse that's connected with football. We should just ignore it, really. And you don't, you don't need to force every football player to take the knee in order to combat that. Just ignore it, it will go away. Thank you. Um, my, my question relates to something that's been alluded to, especially by Oscar in his latest comments, but that I'm concerned about that we're fooling ourselves. And it's this idea of bottom-up versus top-down. Uh, for example, the Super League, the, the comment was that it was stopped by the fans. I'm not that sure. I hope it is true. Sort of like the Brexit of, uh, you know, a, a protest by the working class standing up to the man or whatever. But fact of the matter is the entire cultural elite were against the Super League 
from Gary Lineker and Gary Neville through to every magazine on the left and right, they were all against it. And I think that, if not had the deciding uh, effect, had a massive impact. Whereas now compare that to the woke, taking the knee, trans, um, uh, well, men, biological men competing, the culture will lead all behind that. And that's why the voice of the fan and the protestation of the fans of the working class isn't as efficient uh, versus that because then the cultural elite will call someone like yourselves bigots and transphobes, etc., etc. And, and final comment, if you want to know why players take the knee, you know, by default here in the UK and they're not being forced to just read the book I always carry with me, The Power of the Powerless by Vaclav Havel. It's the grocer uh, who puts out the sign, Work, uh, Workers of the World Unite. They don't really mean it, but they have to do it to be part of this cultural phenomenon. Otherwise, they are considered heretics. Thank you. And the person behind you? Um, a couple of points. Firstly, Sophie, I salute you on your bravery for what you say. Um, I think you're, you're spot on. Um, secondly, uh, the aspect of racist chanting. I'm the first to enjoy the humor of, uh, of football chanting. But to say that racist chanting is dead, um, and, and Donald, I respect what your father's comment may have been, but last night at Hampden Park, when Israel played Scotland, the racist abuse was disgusting, and it is not dead. Um, my final ma main point that I, I scribbled down earlier, Donald, you suggested that sport could be the solution to the cultural wars. Um, my observation, and, and something that I raised yesterday in, a, in the, the, the panel on culture versus will culture survive the culture wars, is to what extent are sportsmen themselves inflaming uh, the, the culture wars. And I, I'll look at taking the knee, where many of our Premier League footballers will take the knee before a game, but next year will fly off to Qatar to play in a tournament. <laughs> They'll play in a tournament in which the stadia and the infrastructure have been built at February this year, the cost was six and a half thousand lives, though that total has to have risen by now. Six and a half thousand lives of people who've toiled in virtual slavery as well to construct the stadium and infrastructure, and I think it's a disgusting piece of hypocrisy. I'd like to pick up something Dilip said. I've been watching football live since 1963 in a place called Moss Side, Manchester, where I was taken by my father, and as soon as I could get rid, get rid of going with him, I went myself, on my own with my friends. Now, I, don't, I won't say there was not um, racist chanting, more racist shouting, I would say, at the very beginning I went, but it almost imperceptibly died away. If someone had played badly for the opposition, they were just a bastard these days, they weren't anything else. And then I thought, well, it's just because we're in Moss Side and this is what City fans are, much more cultured than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> now, to my shame, and I make a confession, and it's a big confession, but to my shame, I have occasionally gone to Old Trafford, otherwise known as the Swan, and stood on the Stratford end. And I, when I was there, I suddenly realised, besides the fact that I happened to watch United, the fans were the same. They weren't racist. They weren't this was in 1968, 69, 70. So when suddenly kick out racism came about, I, ha I had conversations. Do, do we, are we, do, are we, do you, it was like that. We couldn't believe the amount of publicity something was getting that had seeped out of the game. It had gone. Well, I say, take your point about the match yesterday. I didn't watch it, I don't know what they were saying. But I do know that if you go to an English football match, you will not get racist chanting. No one does it. You won't even get racist shouting. You might get someone called like Raheem Sterling, I've heard him called all sorts of things by Liverpool fans, but never by his race. So what I'd like to say is that it became a problem from somewhere outside of football, brought into English football, if you like, I would say, and it's made it worse because it was virtually gone. And I think that's a very important point to make. Okay. And the... Yeah. You made an interesting point, Sophie, with regards to women's football. If you... It could... If, it's, if there's no protest regarding allowing trans, it could be taken away. It could disintegrate. 
I disagree with you. Um, my background, my father was useless. Useless, gone, useless. Um, my mum had to do my mum had to do all kinds of things, and she was mentally ill, schizophrenia. I say that again, schizophrenia. She had, and the love she gave me, and the support she gave me, bringing up three kids, is amazing. Do not underestimate women. Women with vaginas, with vaginas, please. Cervix. Do not cervix. Thank you. Do not underestimate your power. So you may be down for a certain time, but you will not <coughs> lose out. I'm telling you, on football, because women are so strong. Because they, they need to be, because so many men, unfortunately, do not want to step up. They want to be weak, which is fine. It's their business. So please, you have my full support. But don't worry. Women's f football, sport, will last and carry on. Trust me. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm a Newcastle United fan, so it's been a big week for me, <laughs> I, which I'm in two, two minds about, but that's a different question. Um, uh, we're told to encourage and embrace diversity, which I'm all for, but at the same time, we're told that there aren't actually that many differences biologically between men and women, which is a total paradox. Um, although I agree with you, Sophie, I, I also think um, it is going to be a problem in male sports as well, because how do you de-socialize men, in, especially in a contact sport like that, to go for a tackle the same way as you would uh, a man, even if you know in their mind that they are now male, um, there's decades and decades of socialization into that we don't, we treat women differently, especially in terms of our physicality. So how is it not going to compromise um, competition, and the competitive nature of football, um, even subconsciously? Um, obviously, as, as boys are growing up now, it can change, but in terms of if it went into the premiership as it is, how on earth are you going to encourage? I feel sorry for men in that sense. Like how are they going to be able to compete against a, a trans male? Is that the right term? Am I making any sense at all? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's my are. question. Thank yeah, you. you. Thank you. Look, uh, there's a few more hands. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is get the panel to come up very briefly and then we'll go out again. So, uh, Donald, do you want to come in first? Yeah, on, this, on the, the Hamden incident, this is a sort of culture I know really well. It's actually not, not what you might think it is. So in Scotland, you have a sort of proxy or phony war. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in Derry. Uh, if you look down in the Craigan Estate in Derry, where Bloody Sunday took place, you'll see Palestinian flags flying all over the place. If you go to Ibrox, you will see Israeli flags being flown. And it's a proxy phony war, which is really a sectarian issue in Scotland between Catholics and Protestants. None of those people give a toss about those two issues. It's not, I honestly don't believe it's anti-Semitism, actually knowing some of those people personally as well. So I'd be sort of, you know, it's worrying, but it's sort of not what we think it is. Uh, uh, I think that's the case. I think on the Brexit, the, uh, the, the Super League thing was very interesting. I think it was closer to a sort of a misunderstanding. It actually came out of Real Madrid. Real Madrid and Barcelona are in financial trouble. They needed to solve the debt problem. And I think it was a massive misunderstanding by the European clubs here about British culture in general. So I take your point. I think you're right. It wasn't just fans here. I think it was like a mini Brexit thing here. That complete misunderstanding of what British people think about sport. Because there were six English clubs who had signed the document. So the people at the top there also misunderstood uh, British culture in a more general sense than just working class. So I, I wholly agree with that analysis there. I think that was uh, a, certainly true. Now, I've worked in Qatar, whoever mentioned Qatar. I've been there a lot. And if there's one place on the planet you would choose not to have the World Cup, it would be Qatar. You can barely step out the front door of the hotel without getting roasted <coughs> to death. Never mind the climate change issues and, of course, the fact that hundreds, if not thousands, of people have died. I mean, it's really modern slavery. I mean, you know, I took time to go and see the camps where these workers were living. It's appalling, truly appalling. And it's not right in this day and age that we should be pandering to this. Not right at all. Um, so really briefly, um, I think the, the, the real threats to sport actually come in many ways from within sport. So, um, I mean, I think, um, you know, the Super League, the kind of loss of competitive balance that we see 
I, I suppose it's commercialisation, and, and one of the consequences of commercialisation of sport is that there's a there's a, a kind of uh, tendency to to want to keep all the money and not be relegated, and, and that way you destroy the jeopardy and the integrity of sport. But you know, it, it, those things can be resisted. But that's to me where the threat comes from, not from the kind of culture war. Um, I think the biggest. You know, I, I thought VAR was probably the worst thing to happen to English football. And I've written about it. I've said it'll kill football. I still think it, it's awful um, and needs to be scrapped. But actually, having lived through kind of a year of fanless football under COVID, I realised that actually, you know, if you take fans out of football, you kill, you kill the sport. You know, it ceases to be the same thing. The players aren't held to account. The, the spectacle isn't the same. I, I found it really painful watching games, right? Because, you know, even if you're watching kind of close, fought, dull football matches with your mates and you've had a few drinks, there's some enjoyment in that. You can moan about the game while you're watching it. If you're watching at home, sober, there's no fans in the stadium, um, I, I just found it excruciating. And I realised that actually you take... You take spectators out of sport and you kill sport, right? It, it's something else, you know. It, it's, it becomes something of, of completely different character. And, you know, I think that's, the, that's, that's, that's where you destroy sport. But I don't think that comes from the culture wars. I think the pandemic response, you could argue, has cu cultural kind of um, dimensions. But I think that that was a, you know, it was a kind of unique situation. And I think that... Even the even the, the sort of the, uh, the, the the broadcasters don't want fans out of the stadium because it adds to the the atmosphere and it makes the spectacle better to watch. I mean, they it's not because they particularly like football fans, but they like to like them as a sort of stage army to 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 create interest amongst TV fans. So you take all that away and you lose you you, you do damage sport. Um, right, thank you everyone for your questions. I'm quickly going to touch on the whole taking the knee thing and we are going to take this shit to church now, so listen up. Um, right, so they say that anybody who is against taking the knee is automatically a racist. Well, I've got a question for you. How comes we didn't see this reaction with Kick It Out? How comes we didn't see this reaction with Show Racism the Red? And how comes we still don't see this reaction with Take a Stand that we use in women's football? The reason why people are against taking the knee is because that particular gesture portrays values and connections with an organisation that people cannot and will not fundamentally support, including myself. You cannot tell me that this has got nothing to do with Black Lives Matter because you paraded it all over your shirts at the beginning of the 2020 season. Now, those people who are against that aren't racist because those people weren't against those campaigns that have become formally. People aren't against people making campaigns against anti-racism. They are against this particular gesture. But since they love to lecture us so much, I'm going to lecture them for a bit. How on earth can you tell me and lecture us all that this country is institutionally racist and all of the other rubbish that they love to tell us that they are when you're going to go parading to Qatar in the World Cup wearing your fancy Nike boots Qatar that has killed millions of people building their stations, uh, stadium sorry, and that ha kills gay people and where women virtually have no human rights. How many rainbow wrist armbands do you think we're going to see in Qatar? Because I dare them to wear it. I dare them to wear it because they won't. And not only that, for example, let's touch on Newcastle. Newcastle is now owned by the Saudis. You know, the human rights champions that are the Saudis. Oh, yes, FA, come on, lecture us on inequality in England. Let's bring the Saudis in because, you know, they're really great towards women, aren't they? Wonderful. And not only that, they're all sponsored by Nike. Well, Nike are known for their slave labour. So black lives clearly didn't matter then with those little kids in the sweatshops, did it? Where's your black lives matter then? Because those poor people are slave traders. You know, and you're parading on your millions of pound contracts with Nike, telling us all that we're all racist. Yet those poor kids in there have got no rights. People in Qatar have got no rights. People in Saudi Arabia have got no rights. I didn't hear any of them talk about Afghan women who are now you know, desperate to come here because they're stuck in Pakistan and their citizenship runs out. But yeah, put your knee, because your knee on the floor won't fix racism in this country and in other countries. But maybe you should start focusing on your priorities since you've got much bigger platforms and help those globally instead of lecturing us here that we're all racist because a couple of online anonymous tweets from people that are sat in their mum's bathrooms have come on Twitter. And that's my opinion on that. On the trans thing, 
The reason why we won't have the same problem in the men's sport is because, quite frankly, those females that have become males won't get anywhere near professional sports. Why? Because men are better than women. So we don't have to worry about that problem because they ain't getting anywhere near it. That's it. <laughs> Right, I'm going to touch a little bit on uh, a couple of topics. I'm going to touch on Qatar, but first I'm going to address the Super League thing, which I think it was a great point, and I think you're half right. I do think that um, the influences of, 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 of British culture in general, and of course the, the commentators, uh, Neville and, and, and Lineker, and even you know journalists, uh, Piers Morgan, people that have big following, they obviously, and, and the British government as well, they obviously uh, had a big impact on the fall of the Super League. But I don't think you can. Um, I don't think we should uh, distract from the um, the amount of anger at the moment there are in certain clubs, especially the ones in the in the Super League. Um, as I said, I'm an Arsenal fan, and Kroenke is really not liked at Arsenal, I and mean, that's an understatement. He is absolutely hated at that club, um, and to the point where he doesn't even go to to, to Arsenal um, purely because well, the decline of Arsenal is is, is what Arsenal fans see. Arsenal fans see that under him we've seen a decline of the football club. Um, the same with United and the Glazers. Um, so these owners actually, um, they, they, they don't fear the fans, but they half um, have to listen to the fans in certain respects if they're going to have any chance of really keeping them on side. Right? And so um, the people, who, um, and also got said that the, the Super League was Madrid and Barca that instigated it, and that is true. Madrid and Barca are in deep financial tr trouble, especially Barcelona. Um, but also what it was was the fact that in English football we have um, we've got about six, seven, eight clubs competing for the top four, right? Whereas if you go back ten years, it was four clubs the top four. If you go back ten years before that, it was basically two clubs competing for the league. So clubs, what they wanted is they wanted stability and they wanted to know that every single year they're going to be in the same spot, regardless. So there's a bit of that in there, and there's also a bit of the fact that a lot of these owners, let's look at the Cronky, uh, the Cronkies. They come from, from the United States, right? And the, the, the sporting culture is incredibly different in the United States. And there was no re, there's no real connect between Cronky and the fans, um, et cetera, et cetera. On Qatar, I am going to touch on it a little bit. And uh, there is outrage about Qatar, and rightly so, you know, uh, what's going on in Qatar and whatnot. I will defend the players a little bit here, because, uh, the, um, because the players, although they're taking the knee and, and, and you know, they're, they're doing all this progressive stuff, the players didn't themselves pick the venue for the World Cup, right? The players have an opportunity, right? Especially some of the younger ones that will come through, have an opportunity to play at a World Cup for their nation. I don't think it's fair to advocate or almost lecture players not to go to the World Cup and not take up that opportunity. Because I think anyone would. I think actually the bigger hypocrisy that people should look at is the way in which the England players, Gareth Southgate and everyone in this country, were very easy to, to lecture Hungary, for example, Right, on, on human rights abuses and, and, and gay rights and all this sort of thing. They're very quick to lecture them. Right? Not boycott, lecture. But they haven't yet said anything about Qatar. In fact, Gareth Southgate got asked, I think it was this week, about Qatar and human rights, and he just refused to answer. So that is the hypocrisy, not, not boycotting it. Because it's, just, it's, not, it's, it's not, as common sense says, it's not realistic that players should not go to a World Cup. I don't think it's fair on them, because it's not their fault that the, that the thing is in... Um, Qatar. Um, yeah. I'll, um, yeah. Luke, I'll take a couple of people very quickly and then, yeah. Quick question. Dalip, you were talking about how you've covered um, over the decades the attempts to kind of sterilise football and what goes on in the stadium and um, the change in the demographics of who can afford football tickets these days. So what, what do you think about the impact of possibly COVID passports and how that's going to work in terms of controlling who's going to be in the stadium and, and also uh, do, what, what do we think about grassroots football do we think support for that is going to grow and the division between that Premier League and, and the much smaller clubs um, just on the um, spectators um, I to widen it out from football a little bit I think that when we watched the Olympics <coughs> as well we really missed the spectators uh, in the stadiums in the, um, Olymp for the Olympic Games and I think for all sport spectators are very are, are, are just important without them there it is, it is dull um, I think the taking of the knee just seems so performative 
Um, so, in some ways, I kind of, it, it's just a performance. It seems to have lost any kind of wider um, meaning or conversation even. Um, but what I was interested in, in the context of this discussion, which has been really interesting, is the reaction to the penalty uh, losses in the World, in the World Cup. Um, because that uh, reaction, um, kind of, which was apparently from fans, but I don't really believe so, um, but then the media reaction in relation to that um, conversation, how do you rate that? What do you think about that? Okay, so everybody's got like, sorry, we have to wind up now. Everybody's got like 45 seconds from the panel just to say what they think. I would just say, I'm taking the, I'm slightly more pessimistic because these American cultural trends, however performative they come, they do tend to wash over us and become established. So it's slightly, made, you know, <laughs> I'm not quite so optimistic as some people, but anyway. So we finish in the same order we started. Donald, final okay. kick. Yeah. I said at the beginning that England had given a lot of these sports to the world. And honestly, I'm not English, but this is a very tolerant culture, you guys, honestly. I have lived here for 30 years. And I think there is no other country in the world that is making such an effort on these issues, to be honest. That's why I really think that British sport is at the forefront of this. We really have. And I'm, you know, we're probably of a similar age, my good friend from Moss Side here. And I'm with him on this, you know. I've lived through this. I'm 64 years old. I've seen the really serious stuff way back then. In Scotland, not England, interestingly, around the sectarian stuff. I mean, real... I, I, you know, I've seen people stabbed after matches because they're a Catholic. Uh, that's now, thankfully, gone, as is a lot of the racist chants and so on. So I think we're really, we've really got somewhere here. As for... The issue here around the black players and the penalties, again, I go back to this thing about discounting the social media racism, you know? It's real, it's there, but it's not a place. And I don't think you're ever going to eliminate it because in a, uh, in a population of 65 million people, you're going to have a few nutcases who will do this. And that's by and large what's being exaggerated. They really are not typical of the very good people I hear in this audience who love sport, love the essence of sport, and want to eliminate that stuff. To be honest, most of us don't witness much of it anyway and think it's exaggerated. <coughs> so, good on you, England, uh, for giving us sport and uh, keeping up the good fight. Thanks, <laughs> Donald. Uh, Oscar. Uh, I'm going to touch quickly on, on the, the penalty thing. Um, I think there was a huge proportion of them, if not the majority, that were, that were not from this country. And, but that just doesn't get reported. Like, there's a narrative that the media want to lay on, which is about, we're going to tackle racism so hard because they're pushing so much to be anti-racist they need to, they need racism to combat it to go both ways so i think there's a bit of that in it uh, so they wouldn't report things which were just blatantly true um on the marcus rashford, rashford thing i think that's an interesting one quickly because i think that uh, a lot of people criticize marcus rashford for for, for being political and, and, and that type of thing and to be honest i think it's unfair criticism because I, for two reasons firstly i don't think he's ever overstepped the mark into being strictly political He's, 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 he, he's disagreed with policies with the government, but, you know, he's a free citizen. He can do what he likes. He's campaigned for, um, for children to, to, to uh, children, uh, child hunger and that sort of thing. And, you know, I think that's perfectly fine. He's not done it in, for Manchester United. He's not represented Manchester United. He's doing it outside in his own time. Um, if you compare out that for me, someone who crossed the line, I think Gary Neville sometimes crosses the line, uh, not because of his views. Um, I find him interesting to listen to, just because when he's on Sky Sports... I want to listen to Gary Neville talk about how bad Arsenal are, right? That's what I want to listen. Right? I, don't, I, I don't want to listen to Gary Neville lecture me on the Tory party and Boris Johnson and Brexit and go on and on and on, which is interesting, but leave it for Good Morning Britain, leave it for a political show, right? So I think that's where, that's where the line is uh, for that. And quickly, um, uh, yeah, so to summarise, I think that um, the fans are the important thing in football, and I think, that, um, I think that football needs to be very careful to keep the fans on side, stop the hypocrisy, stop the, uh, um, uh, being div so divisive, be more nuanced, uh, and stop putting sport back into politics as well. Sophie. Oh, this has been fun, isn't it? Um, right, so I'm going to just give you some key messages to take away from a little ginger teenager sitting on some random panel. Um, first of all, let's keep it simple. If players have the right to take the knee, fans are well within their rights to disagree with it. And that is black and white as it gets. That's simple, that's free speech, and that's what we have in this country. Secondly, on your point, um, I know it's obviously not football related, but I speak on this quite a lot. 
Um, forcing young people and putting ideas in their head and allowing them to transition when they're young is child abuse, and that is that. Um, fans are the biggest pride possession in women's football because, you know, all the other big sports take their fans for granted, whereas any fan that comes into our doors and supports women's sports when we desperately need it is absolute heroes. And finally, thank you all guys so much for your questions and for your fun today. It's been very enjoyable. Thanks. So, um, why is sport a kind of battleground for the culture wars? And I think, I think you see a whole um, array, I mean, pretty much every political and cultural kind of issue is kind of refracted through the prism of sport. And the reason for that is that sport, and particularly for sports like football, are genuinely popular institutions. Um, and invariably, that's, that's why politicians, cultural commentators or whatever are attracted to, to them. It's a way of kind of connecting with the people. And I think that, ironically, is also what should give us hope, which is, um, you know, you, you can live in an echo chamber, you know, in a university or in the public sector, a voluntary sector, and imagine that the rest of the world is like you, and it really isn't. And, you know, I, I do think there are, there are limits to which wokeness has penetrated society. It, it might seem to us like it's all-consuming, but it, it, you go to a football match and it really isn't there at all. Um, and I, so I think I, I, I'd like to give end on the example of a, a sporting hero of my own. Um, and, I mean, I guess Emma Raducanu will win Sports Personality of the Year, but I'd give it to Chris Perry. Does anyone know who Chris Perry is? Chris Perry was the 25-year-old England fan who drank 20 cans of Strongbow... <laughs> banged a load of powder and stuck a flare up his ass in Leicester Square. <laughs> and he, to me, is testimony to the fact that football fans, despite all of the wokeness, all of the COVID-secure guidelines, just behave badly. I think that's wonderful, and I think that's the thing that should give us hope. 